I was uh, commissioned in the Army in 1976. I graduated from Loyola College, uh, had an ROTC scholarship, and um, I was pre-med. Uh, got a couple of interviews uh, from med medical schools, didn't get accepted, so I went in and took my commission, figuring I would just retake the tests and reapply. And 26 and a half years later, I retired out of the Army. So, so I stayed in for a career. Um, I was uh, commissioned chemical corps, actually. I was commissioned in the Ordnance Corps with a chemical specialty in 1976 because at that point they were getting ready to disband the chemical corps. And uh, about a month after I got commissioned, uh, the Army came back and said all chemical track specialties you either transfer into the chemical corps or pick another corps. So I got to transfer back into the chemical corps at that point. Uh, so I've been a chemical officer you know, my whole career. Uh, most of my assignments have been with the Tactical uh, Army, uh, so I've served with uh, 1st Infantry Division forward in Germany, uh, served my initial assignment in Hawaii with the 25th Infantry Division, uh, served a stint in the R&D lab, the Chemical Systems Lab at that time at Edgewood, um, 7th Corps in Germany, uh, came to the Command and General Staff College and actually came to Fort Hood after that. Uh, so I arrived in 89, served with the 2nd Armored Division for a year as a Division Chemical Officer. Uh, and I was a Major at the time, uh, the S3 Operations Officer uh, slot for the Chemical Battalion came open summer of 90 and I wanted to come over, the, uh, the General supported me, I came over and I, I think about three days after I signed into the battalion, Iraq attacked and took away. Timing is and, everything. Uh, yeah. And so I was in the battalion very, very short period of time. Uh, we got activated to prepare to move and deploy. So my whole time as the operations officer was really preparing the battalion to deploy over to Iraq, Saudi Arabia at the time, really. Right. Uh, take it through uh, the defense of Saudi Arabia, liberation of Kuwait, Desert Storm, redeploy the battalion back. And then uh, uh, the, they, there was a shortage of uh, uh, Command and General Staff College graduates, and so the battalion commander, Colonel Kilgore, asked me to stay on another year as the XO. I said, great, that's what I wanted to do anyway, so I stayed on as the XO for, uh, for another year. I left the battalion in 92, went to the Pentagon, um, and that was my first tour on the Army staff. Um, served there, came, got promoted, picked up for command, and so about two years later, 18 months later, I came back here to command the 2nd Kim Battalion. And I commanded from 94 to 96. Um, went to the Army War College uh, right after that. And then I went to the Joint Staff and worked on J in J5 Strategy and Policy. Uh, a couple of interesting things. We, uh, I, I was appointed to head up the anthrax vaccination program for DOD. And so that's when we first started that. Uh, so I put that together while I was on the Joint Staff. What was that in? That was in the Joint Staff in the Pentagon? That was in 90. That was in 96, 97, yeah. Um, and then after that, I got picked for uh, brigade level command, and I commanded Johnston Atoll, where we had the chemical demill <coughs> operations on Johnston Island. And uh, so I went out there to command for about a year. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little, Two or three little, it's three little islands on the middle of the Pacific. It's about 870 miles southwest of Hawaii. In the middle of the ocean, you have this little uh, ring of islands, and uh, we had chemical weapons stored out there, and our job was to destroy the chemical weapons, and they had a big plant. I, I think you gave me uh, a URL. Yes, okay. Because I, right. I remember looking it up right. and, and okay. seeing that. Yeah, right. I, that was uh, yeah, that was a that was place with just time. enough dirt to build a runway. It oh. was. And they, they dredged up some of the coral in the lagoon and actually built more of the island. So when you look at it from the air, it, it almost looks like a big aircraft carrier. Really? Big runway down the middle. But we had yeah. about 1,100 people on the island, uh, military and also uh, civilians. Wow. And, um, so I, I did that for a year. Very self-sufficient, 1,100 people. That's yeah, all. yeah. They, we we did our own water. Uh, the barge brought food. Uh, we had our own power. We I think my my command actually paid for the uh, HBO and the satellite 
TV on the island. I love that. So. The good news is you're king of all you survey. The bad news is you can't survey very far. That's right. It was about a two mile long by about a mile wide island. Um, it, was, it was a great assignment. Yeah. Tremendous soldiers and very focused mission. And uh, I so really enjoyed that. So after that command, uh, my family had stayed in DC area. So I came back to the Pentagon and uh, I was assigned to the Army staff to head up the, uh, actually I came back to the Army staff to be the Deputy Director for Force Development for the Army. And the Force Development Director for the Army really is responsible for managing all the programs from bayonet to tank and all the systems that the Army has, all the equipment that they need. Operationally? Yes, so whatever the Army has, if it's a program and it's funded, then the Director of Force Development is responsible to really put together how, how do we structure a program and develop the technology and, a, and, a, and then field capabilities. And so I was his deputy and uh, so I did that for about 18 months. Uh, What's the relationship between Force Development and TRADOC? TRADOC is Training and Doctrine Command. So they, they really come up with the initial, uh, we think we need this capability. They take a look at uh, what they call uh, doctrine uh, leader development organization. They look at all the changes that the Army could do to meet that need. And if, and if changing the doctrine, changing the organization, training leaders and soldiers, if none of that works, then they have to have a new program. We need to develop a new tank or future combat system. And so once that requirement is validated by the Army G3, the DESOPS, then it's given to the G8, the De Deputy Chief of Staff of Programs, who has the FD working for him. And we put the program together and get it funded. And so, uh, so I have a lot of background in, in corporate training. So uh, okay. TRADOC is more competency definition and force development looks at, okay, you've told us what competencies we need, what do we have to do to develop those competencies? Right, right. Okay. In terms of material, so okay. so the FD really looks at what are the, we, we understand the capabilities that's needed by the warfighter, and then we have to take a look at technologies and how do you translate technologies into a program and get it out to the field. Uh, to be used, and so the FD looks at fielding schedules. How do you integrate into a unit? And it's, it's, it's a big uh, nut roll to put a unit through fielding a new radio. But if you can imagine mm -hmm. fielding a tank with new radios and new trucks and everything else, that's a that's a huge undertaking. Yeah, yeah. So so we look at the windows of where a unit would stand down operationally, and then. We, we do what we call unit set fielding. We field all the new stuff in one window and, the, and train them, and then they'll have everything they need until the next period of time that they get a reset. And so that's that's evolving. The Army's kind of evolving somewhat in how they do that. So I did that for about, uh, about a year, 18 months, and then uh, my last assignment on the Army staff was as chief of the uh, Kim Bio Defense Programs. Uh, in, in GA. And that was in the Vietnam? Right. Yeah. Yeah. When I was the deputy FD was when uh, we had 9-11. And so, matter of fact, it was kind of on our side of the building. Uh, I was in our, uh, the FD's office was on the inside ring. Oh, so you were in the Pentagon oh, yeah. at the time. Yeah, but, he was in Washington at the time. I was having uh, a heart attack. Yeah, yeah I've... Uh, Couldn't get I've, through, of course. If, if right. that fourth plane had hit the Capitol, I'm sure I would have heard it. Because yeah. Because I was... was right there. I was... I had gone to a business meeting a day early in Fairfax. Okay. And I was going over to the archives to do some research. Sure. And... Um, and were you in the Pentagon building when it hit? Yeah. You heard that yeah, baby hit. sure did. Wow. I remember it, it sounded like, if you can imagine, a bomb going off in a long tunnel. Because the Pentagon is just a, a huge concrete building with so many quarters. And so that's what it reminded, it sounded like. But I remember the explosion was so big that you could feel the concussion waves hit your chest. Wow. And I thought, I thought a bomb in the parking lot uh -huh. was really what I thought. 
but I remember we evacuated everybody out, um, and uh, coincidentally, it was really kind of strange. Where the plane hit was the new office spaces that our director was supposed to occupy. Um, but the contractor was late laying cable and getting the computer set up. Thank God. And so our, you know, our, our general had made the decision. I said, let's just stay where we're at. Let's let them get everything wired up, hooked up, and then we'll just move everybody at one time rather wow. than stretch this out. I'm glad we did that. Timing is everything. Isn't it? But yeah, we were, we were fortunate. Let me go back to, um, well, uh, so you retired shortly after that. Right. Okay. So I retired in uh, January 2003. Okay. Right. Uh, one thing, uh, you had been uh, with, uh, you had been in Germany and then with Seventh Corps, and I was wondering if the if the connections and experience that you had there were of help in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, because you were under Seventh Corps. Right. That time. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, it was kind of strange. The first infantry division forward, the separate brigade from the first ID that stationed in Germany, who I was initially stationed in Germany, I saw the first ID patch in Dahran, and I thought Big Red One, and I thought these were the guys from Kansas at Fort Riley. And when I went up to meet them, they said, "No, we're from Gerping in Germany, the first ID forward, and their job was to receive troops." Get, help them get the equipment off the ships, help troops marry up with the equipment, and help them get out into the sand. And, and that was their mission. The 1st Infantry Division itself, uh, we later became attached to them for the ground combat operations. And so we went to join them. So it's kind of deja vu to see my old unit in mm -hmm. yeah. Saudi Arabia receiving the equipment off the ships. When I first forward, let me see if I understand this, but First forward would be, would be the guys that Reforger was supposed to reform. Right. Okay. But it, but it but it never matched up that way. It was kind of interesting. You had the Second Armored Division forward, also a separate mm -hmm. brigade over. And they were in northern Germany, and then the First Infantry in the southern part of Germany. At no time did our war plans ever show us going back to the parent division. So even though. You could say, yeah, we were the forward brigade and helped the rest of the division when they came over. Right. Our work plans, we had a different part of the of the border that for general defense plans. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. I thought initially that we were going to be part of the 1st Infantry. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got over, I learned that it's a separate brigade, uh, significant combat power, and we had a separate mission that we would do. So we would not come back under the... Now, and then when you say we there, who, who does that refer to? Well, the, the first infantry division forward. So, so forward didn't I always envision them sort of acting like a cadre that would absorb right. everybody else. But but they actually stayed as a separate yes. brigade. Right. Fight. We actually were commanded by a one star, and um, and we had uh, all the slice. We had the maintenance slice of the uh, of. So it's almost like an armored cab regiment is a big, very large brigade, uh, but it's commanded by a, a colonel. But he's got aviation, mm -hmm. uh, hel you know, helicopters. He's got uh, artillery. He's got engineers. He's got everything because he's self-sufficient. And so the, the the forward brigades, second armor and first infantry were also like that. We had our own aviation slice. We had maintenance. We had artillery. So we we had. I, I guess I, I think of a brigade as very roughly equivalent to the World War II regimental combat team, which was built around an infantry regiment, but had all of the bells and whistles right. attached to it. it. It's it's almost we've come full circle. The brigade combat teams now that we're going to are just that. I mean, if you really look at them, they have the core infantry armor mix, uh, but they also have the engineers, the signal, the intelligence, the chemical. Mm -hmm. So they have a slice of everything now. Uh, so so we've almost kind of gone back to the old regimental, com we just call them brigade combat teams now. Yeah. Another thing that I, I wanted to ask you about is, um, you, you 
went into ROTC in 76. Well, I graduated then. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so, so 72 is when I started college. Uh, okay. Well, that, that intrigues me because going into ROTC in the early 70s was not something that you did very lightly. Right. right. You, you were liable to get acquainted with some unpleasant people and some very old vegetables. Right. Right. Uh, so tell, tell me how you made that decision and how it worked out. Well, it, as it turned out, when I was in high school, uh, my dad was in the State Department. So we had just come back from Germany uh, for my senior year. And uh, in the summer, we were in the registrar's office at the high school and uh, met up with an old friend who had, I had known several years ago when we lived there before, before we went to Germany. And so he was filling out a form for our ROTC scholarship. And I thought, this sounds good. So I filled one out and applied. And we both got uh, four-year scholarships. So I had an ROTC scholarship and, and that kind of helped shape where I went to college. And so Loyola College was close by. Uh, my parents lived in Annapolis, he worked in D.C., uh, and a girlfriend had just come back from Germany, uh, later to be my wife, and, uh, and so figured ROTC, Loyola College, good college, uh, close by, yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, I don't remember a lot of harassment on the campus. It was, it was pretty good. It was, it's a Jesuit college. Yeah. Um, and they were, for the most part, um, the student body was pretty supportive. Um, and, and we had a small detachment. And it was 72? 72, yeah. See, that's, that's a little bit after. Yeah, you, well, you still well, had some of the so, campuses. But it wasn't yeah. Too I guess the, bad. Yeah, we, it would, yeah. yeah, the peak of it was in 69, 70. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, tell me about your family. Okay. Uh, my mother's Chinese, and so she was born in mainland China. Uh, I, uh, my dad, State Department, and so I was born in Taiwan. Uh, and I remember really being there till I was about four is when we left there. Uh, my uh, sister was born in the Philippines, uh, so. Uh, I have another sister I was born in Japan and my brother was born in California. So we moved around quite a bit and um, we stationed a lot of uh, villages in, in, in the places in the Pacific. And so we, again, it's almost like a military background. The State Department is kind of the same way. And so we got posted all over the world. And uh, so that's kind of my background. We traded for an army career. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mike, uh, what is uh, John's father? He was medical corps. But he was at the Pentagon. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about his career track. My brother-in-law, uh, his father was a colonel of the medical corps. Sure, okay. Probably worked in the Surgeon General's yeah. office. Probably. Army he was, Surgeon he was General. Chinese. His name was Mu. Okay. And I don't know whether it was colonel. Yeah, he was a colonel. Uh, and then you married a girl from Germany. Oh, well, well, actually, yeah, her dad was in the army. Oh, okay. uh, station, uh, when we met, my dad was uh, posted with the embassy in Bonn, Germany, and her dad was with the uh, Armory Cab Regiment at Fulda. And so for both of our high schools, it only went up to a certain level, so we both met in Frankfurt, Germany, in the dorm. And, uh, and, and so we dated that year. Uh, my dad got returned back to uh, D.C. Her dad stayed for another year and then got posted, uh, tra transferred to uh, Fort, uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. And so we met back up, started dating again, and uh, we got married. It'd be a good thing. Yeah. Some, some things seem like they're destined to happen, you know. Exactly. If, if they don't happen the first time, then they just keep your, rubbing your nose in it until you get the message. That's right. They swap out. point in time in the Pentagon they were you know and the chemical corps is very small we have like one regular general position right and it was one of those things where uh, it last summer last summer right it's very soon yeah and the uh, the structure is, is pretty much at the division level you have a lieutenant colonel on the staff as the chemical officer and you have a sergeant major and some senior NCOs. So that's a, that's a division chemical section. At the core level, there is a full colonel staff officer uh, with 
NCOs and soldiers, uh, and again, their their staff elements. We have. And, and will those be people who view their career track as in the chemical corps? Yes. Okay. Right. They wear the they wear the chemical brass, uh, and and so they're a technical staff, pretty much. They're advisors to the commander for nuclear, biological, chemical warfare issues. Um, and um, but interestingly enough. The, the company, chemical company, is there's one company, it used to be one company in a division. Uh, and, and where it was assigned kind of varied. A lot of times it was assigned as a separate troop in the, art, in the CAV regiment. Uh, there was a, a cavalry squadron in a division and normally it was attached there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were with the uh, division artillery. Uh, sometimes with the division support command, so it, it, it kind of varied who had this com company, but you had a company in the structure, and you had a lieutenant colonel, so that's commanded by a captain, and a lieutenant colonel out at the, like the division staff. What is interesting is the employment of chemical troops, units, because, uh, and, and you'll kind of see my bias because I think we're all victims of our own experience. So when I came to the battalion and we deployed over to uh, operations in Iraq, um, we were a separate battalion. And so we were organized, we had companies attached to the battalion. And so uh, you can either have companies taken away from the battalion, split out, and every division gets one for direct support kind of, uh, or you could take a look at the mission and where, if, where does it? Where do you need that support? And then keep it at a battalion, and then have the battalion be able to really mass the effects of chemical forces on the battlefield when and where you need it. And that's where I was pushing for. And so that's what we did. Um, when we arrived in theater, our mission. We were attached to the 18th Airborne Corps. We were part of the special, uh, the the Dragon Brigade of the 18th Airborne Corps. And our mission was to help in the defense of Saudi Arabia. And so we looked at the uh, mission, we looked at all the divisions that were over there, uh, really getting ready to defend in case Iraq came into uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, I'll never forget, I went into the core operations center and there was this big map in the chemical section, the staff section, said, here's the mission we have for you guys. And he rolled this acetate down over the map. And there must have been a thousand red dots on this map. And I said, okay, so what is this? And they said, these are all the decontamination points from every unit that we've got on the ground. So if there's, if somebody gets hit with a Scud missile and gets contaminated, that's where you guys are gonna go. And I'm looking at this and I said, okay, time out. We, based on the assets that we have on the ground and the ability to cover the numbers of troops that we're talking about, you need to tell me what are the one or two key units that you want protected and let me get effects, mass, decontamination, assets, water, bladders. I mean, you have logistics to be able to go with it. I can't just flex these soldiers throughout the kingdom to decontaminate where the unit, so. It's like Napoleon said, to defend everything is to defend nothing. And I, I said, it's we can't do that. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I said, tell me what the focus is and then let me organize the assets. And that's what we did. And so, so we narrowed that down to a couple of key places. Yeah. And then we were able to look at the logistics. I also talked to them about policy in theater. What is the policy if we have a scud attack and there is chemicals used? And they said, well, everybody would go to their decontamination point. I said, okay, have you talked to the MPs? Who's gonna control the roads? I mean, we've got thousands and thousands of units over here. You don't want everybody on the street, along with the civilians, all at one time. You're never gonna get anywhere. So my recommendation is, as a policy, if you get attacked, stay where you're at, assess your damage, assess your casualties, and let's figure out what happened, and then the people that are the worst off, you can then vector them to a contamination, decontamination spot, and we'll meet up with them. 
so it's, it was kind of interesting working through the doctrine, but what I, what I really saw was the chemical corps officers on the staffs, division corps, they're not commanding the battalion. You know, we had a battalion commander whose mission is, tell me what you need done, I'll figure out how to do it, and get the assets where and when you need it. Right. The staff officers don't command assets. They need to help us plan mm -hmm. and get the logistic support, route clearances and all those things. That's what we needed. And so throughout that campaign, we really uh, worked in that fashion in 18th Airborne Corps, and, and we can get into details later about the 7th Corps, but when we were going to move over to 7th Corps, there was a reserve chemical battalion that had come into theater, and we had, really between the S3s and the commanders, worked out, you take the ports, and we'll take a couple of these other key decon sites, and we, we divided up our efforts, because you had different generals in charge of different assets. And the theater support mm -hmm. commander, General Pagonis, owned all the ships and the ports and everything coming through. The 18th Airborne Corps commander owned all the forces on the ground. Well, you both you can't have two chemical battalions at the port. And so we worked out at the chemical battalion level right. and we divvied out the work and everything. Now, what organization had come up with the, the thousand red dots plan? 18th Airborne Corps. That was their initial. Okay, so that, this, that was staff. the chemical staff unit of right. the Corps one. Right, the okay. Corps staff. And and their first initial assessment was, you know, let's get decon sites. Let's. Uh, so they were trying to pre plan it, but I don't think they realized the logistics of executing that plan. And that's why I said, we need to do something different. And so we worked, we, we pulled in, I said, we need to have a conference. Let's pull in all the security forces, the MPs, uh, those, those kinds of commands. Uh, we need to pull in the Saudi medical folks. We need to pull in our hospitals. And we need to have one coherent plan so that if we're gonna ship somebody from a decon site and they've been decontaminated, who's gonna take decontaminated patients? Who's gonna take contaminated patients? We Couldn't have gone on a that. consulting basis down to New Orleans, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, this is one of the things that, so that on the money. I, I love about the, the art is, you know, you, you talk about something like the hurricane, and it's like, well, that might happen some year now, so we should have a drill and plan and learn and do something next year. You guys walk in and, well, how soon can we have to apply this? Thursday. And, and so you have to put together everything you do, but, but where on the, on the domestic emergency side, the planning can stretch over months. Right. Yours has about that many hours. Very compressed, and you got to be able to execute. And, and so I guess uh, you had asked me a question about my, work, my experience in, in Germany, 7th Corps, and translated. And, and really, because of my work in the the maneuver tactical divisions. Right. I, I really looked at the chemical support in the same fashion. How do I mass effects on the battlefield? Which means how do I preposition stocks? How do I get to me if I divided all the decon assets out throughout the, di the division oh. and every battalion had a, a platoon of decon? I'd never be able to do anything because they haul enough water to maybe spray down one tank, right? And then they're, they're, that's mm -hmm. it. And so, to to decon a brigade, a tank brigade, I need some sizable assets. Asset management as opposed leaders. to turning into a liability. Exactly, uh, and that's what we did. Would you would you be relying on on your organic transportation to move those assets to where they were needed, or? or did the division or core provide so both i mean what you, what we identified is is how how much decontaminants can i move uh, we didn't have enough bladders to hold water uh, we didn't i didn't have enough trucks to haul water so for actually to prepare for the ground offensive operation with first infantry division we had asked uh 7th corps for 5000 gallon tankers and we got them uh, we had um, 
I'll never forget, we had actually planned, I planned, and I didn't bring the maps with me today, but I planned two decontamination sites for the 1st Infantry Division because that was going to be the main attack into Iraq. So those were the breach lanes through the minefields and everything. Uh -huh. And so for the 7th Corps, that was going to be the initial punch into Iraq. Uh -huh. And so we figured if, if these Iraqis were going to shoot chemicals on us, it's probably going to be right there. And so again, I looked at it and, and I really saw that to me, it made no sense to have all my decon sliced out. And I was the S3 operations officer, so I wasn't the commander. But it made no sense to me operationally to slice out all the assets. My plan was, let's have two decon sites for the division. And I worked it with the logistics officer. Where are the return routes through the minefields for the vehicles that are shot up, the, the crews that are shot up? Where are we going to have the, the wounded troops and the vehicles coming back? It's on the flank, the outside of the division, not in the center. Right. That's where I put the decon points because I figured the center is where all the traffic is going north. Right. Mm -hmm. The flank is where there's yeah. any traffic coming south, the return flow. And that's where we had positioned it. I had requested uh, engineer support to actually dig decon site, the decontamination sites in. I'll never forget, we had we had it planned, it was in the division order with the 1st Infantry Division at that time, we were attached to the 1st Infantry, uh, and I actually got a call on my radio, and it was the engineer S3, it was a battalion S3, and he said, I've got the entire battalion ready to dig you in, where do I meet you? And we had never had that kind of support in peacetime training because that's a very valuable I, I asset. I was just thinking that that is probably the first time in U.S. military history that the Chemical Corps asked for something and got anything other than yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we got come, come back later when we have time, and that's never exactly. Uh, we had it in the the synchronization plan, the matrix. And uh, I, I said I needed the, the, the points dug in because I still needed to bring water and decontaminants on the ground. So I, about D plus three, about three days before we would attack, is when I have to have everything dug in. So it was about four or five days before the attack. Get this call, I said, okay, meet me at this grid. And you know, it's like a giant gravel parking lot in Saudi Arabia near the border. And we were, I'd say we were about 10 kilometers from the border. And so I said, okay, here's where the return flow is going to be coming. This is where I need to have them dug in. And this entire engineer battalion, just with earth movers, rippers, and everything. And they actually, the three actually said, let me do, let me have my engineer guys do a drawing and see if you think that's okay. And I go, okay. Sure. <laughs> they came back with this drawing. You wouldn't believe it. I, I, somehow it got thrown away. I wish we would have had it because. They had actually thought and said, how are you dumping water into the bladders? And I said, well, it's, it's, it's a tank and pump unit, and so we'll just pump it in. And he goes, okay, they break down, TPUs break down, so how about if I build ramps, earth ramps, for the, for the 5,000 gallon tankers to drive up on gravity them, flow and gravity the flow. I said, perfect. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and That's I said, good with me, dude. And, uh, and run off and everything, and then I had said, um, because of the wind direction could change, right. I don't know what direction the forces will approach, and I don't want them to kind of get goofed up, so I want to have a decon site that I can approach any four directions, depending on the wind, and so I need to have certain stations and sumps and everything dug in to be able to do that. The S3 helped me work out, well, these two you could use for either side, and we kind of worked this up, so it's about a, a square kilometer was the decon point. You had other places where the unit contaminated would assemble. We had worked out the signals where they're responsible for their own security and security while they're going through decontamination, and then on the clean side, forming up, and then they would move out again. So we had worked out, had a company commander in each location with a full company to do that mission. Now, contrast for me that with the kind of response that you got from them when you were on exercises in Germany or in the States. 
it's well, it, obviously it's 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 a bit different because uh, in training, it's the training is focused on the maneuver, tactical fight, right. and that's what they're really focused on. And so to take assets away from that fight is very very tough to do, and they're very reluctant to do it. So because an engineer asset is doesn't even belong to a tank battalion commander. He normally doesn't have that asset to even help out with. Um, and so to, to actually have support pushed to you and to support what you needed professionally, it was great because we actually could, add, we were prepared to actually do what we're trained doctrinally to do. We were trained and ready to do what the division expected us to do. Uh, and, and the soldiers were, were ready. I mean, we had the assets in place, we had the water tankers, we had the extra bladders on the ground, we had gotten all that support. Now, we didn't get slimed as we were going through the breach, uh, but in my mind's eye, being ready and the soldiers able to actually execute what they've been training for all their lives, and now they're there and they're ready to do this mission, I thought was, was tremendous. What I found is the S3 for the battalion, when we joined the 1st Infantry in our attack positions, one of the key things that I did was to make to go and talk to the brigade S3s, the, the combat brigade 3s, and really to understand their scheme of maneuver, their plan for attacking, and, and the division commander's concept of operations. And I remember when we first were joining the 1st Infantry Division, the staff officer, the division chemical officer, lieutenant colonel on the staff, the staff plans showed a company from the battalion given to 1st Brigade, another company given to 2nd Brigade, and a third company would be held with the battalion headquarters in reserve. And again, operationally that just rubbed me the wrong way because I didn't think that supported the general's concept of attack. And so uh, I remember talking with the brigade, the division artillery commander, and the battalion commander, obviously, and and, uh, and saying, if I could come up with a better recommendation for task organization, could I get your support? And I remember him saying, that's fine. Work on it tonight. Brief me in the morning. If I like it, we'll take it to the division chief of staff uh, at the at the morning update. And so when I looked at the mission, when I talked to the brigade staffs and the brigade commanders, I found that one brigade commander said, I might need a platoon of smoke with me. Don't want to drag any decon because I, the general says, I want to attack through the breach. I want to maintain the momentum of attack. I am not stopping to decontaminate. Right. So again, to me, it made no sense to chop all the decon assets to follow the tanks, which aren't going to stop. Where would they stop? It's when they're coming back, back anyway. and they're being shot up, and, and they need new crews, new equipment, mm -hmm. maintenance. That's where we're going to meet them with the decon. So we put that together and proposed that, and that's what the division said, great, that's what we're going to do. And uh, we had, at that point, two mechanized smoke companies. So you saw the M113 tracks, the smoke generators? Yes. We had two full companies of, of 113, so that's about 70 track vehicles, uh, smoke generators. They needed a, a deception plan on the right flank of the 1st Infantry Division, right next to 1st Cav Division, which was in the Wadi Albatine. They wanted to replicate a, a like a division. They wanted to replicate a much larger armored force on the right. flank. Right. Wanted to draw attention away from the main reach where the division was going. And so we worked it up and I said, you know, the two smoke companies could make a lot of smoke, a lot of visible, they could draw a lot of eyeballs to something, right, dust. Uh, they can add radios to the communications chatter, and, uh, and that's what we did. So we actually had two smoke companies minus one platoon that was supporting the 1st Brigade. We had the rest of the two companies attached to a tank battalion. And I'll never forget, our tracks were online, uh, on, on the screen line, really, before we attacked. They were up on the screen line in the middle of Bradleys and tanks. And I think it was one of our tracks, smoke tracks, 
the next vehicle over was a first cab tank. And we were actually in the division wow. boundary. We were right on wow. the scene, yeah. <laughs> which is huge. It's a very important mission because that's where the bad guys yeah. try to find the seams. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so our guys were up there and um, we, that tank battalion commander, was planning raids into Iraq. And my concern was that if the chemical units, platoons and companies go forward and the deception works and the Iraqi tanks fire up, we right. could get our guys killed. And I was right. very concerned right. about force protection for my guys. Yeah. And so I remember talking with the battalion commander and the XO and the S3 of the tank battalion uh, about the operations of how we would do it. And I told them I'm concerned about force protection. I'll never forget, the tank battalion commander says, I tell you what, I will chop a tank platoon to your smoke company. Could your guy handle that? And I said, we'd have to practice because we've never done it, but yeah, if you give some direct support fires wow. with my guys, we had our two companies attached to that tank battalion. Um, there was a shortage of 50 caliber machine gun ammunition. And we were very concerned because we had very little for our smoke tracks. And so before any raids and attacks and everything, we needed to get replenished. Well, our S4 made a trip back to the logistics base, ammunition base, to get ammunition. Right. And apparently at that point, all the 50 cal ammunition in the stockage point was bad. Uh -huh. And we couldn't get any. Well, they had another ship coming in. It was due in, it was due in. It, and it never arrived in time. And I remember asking the executive officer for the tank battalion, again, we're talking force protection, and I said, hey, we still haven't been able to get 50 cal ammunition. We're short. And I, he talked to the battalion, the tank battalion commander, and they came back and said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cross level across the battalion, and each track each will get 100 rounds. So again, these were our maneuver commander, combat commander, saying what makes sense is your guys belong to me. They're part of my team. I'm going to take care of them, and mm -hmm. I will cross level ammunition. Well, they're taking care. Of, they're taking care of them. They've got to take. I mean, it was right, uh, right. the term enlightened self-interest. Hey, uh -oh. it's important. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and they um, did that. But who were the other? Uh, battalion staff officers at this time and, and what did their jobs consist of? Um, Major Panel was the executive officer for the battalion. How do you spell that? P-A-N-E-L-L, I think. First name is Larry. And, and you know, all the names I asked Colonel Wilcox uh, when we came back out of the war, out of the ground fight, and we are trying to logger, find a position in the sand to, to kind of form back up. Um, and I noticed a lot of the units, 2nd Armored Cab Regiment, everybody had a painted sign welcoming their unit back. But we didn't have one because our battalion... So I talked to my driver who was a graphics artist guy, and I said, Seaborn, we need to paint, we need to get a sign, can you paint one? He goes, yeah. If you give me something to paint on, and some paint, so we, can, we can do this. And so the 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 long bed trucks have these sides, yes. And driving on the roads, they always pop off. Yeah. And so I said, let's pick one up. We picked one up, and we went to the corps headquarters, and he found the the artist on staff who had some paint, and so Seaborn got some paint and everything, and he worked that night. And the next morning, I said, okay. This is a welcome back for the battalion, so something with the, the Red Dragon, something about our desert heritage, and like, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kuwait. He goes, okay. So he went up and he painted this thing, it was, it was beautiful. It was a Red Dragon with a turban, a desert oh, kind of wow. turban. Um, and it had 2nd Chemical Battalion, and it had uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kuwait. And that's what we had, and, and we had it, a few years ago, and I haven't seen it, so Dave hasn't seen it, but I asked him and the Sergeant Major if they could find it, because on the back side, I had asked Seaborn, stencil in who were the staff, wow. the principal people in the battalion, and all the companies that were attached, and who were their commanders, and 
and the key leaders. Yeah. And I remember on the back side, if they ever find it, or the names, but I think I've got it written. But Major Panel was the XO. Um, the S4, the logistics officer, was uh, was then Captain Lin, L-I-N, Bill Lin. The S1 personnel officer was Captain, oh, he got out and he's a doctor now. Samples. Oh, this is hard. This is great, great, great name for a guy in the detection business. Samples. <laughs> Bring me samples. Yep. Uh, the S2 was our, um, he was lieutenant, I think he was our signal officer too. Uh, the name escapes me right now. Um, my assistant S3 was Captain Wall, Joel Wall. Uh, the battalion commander was a, a Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore, Daryl. Oh, Command Sergeant Major, I can see his face. Well, it'll come to you. Yeah, basically, uh, we're forward in terms of coordination, in terms of, uh, of plans, uh, how we're going to integrate. And, uh, and so a, a lot of times when we were stationary, like in an attack position, I took the initiative just to, to say, look boss, I'm going this way today to 1st Brigade. He was going to go visit our companies in 2nd Brigade. And, and we coordinated daily on who's doing what. Uh, I had the graphics of what we were going to do in terms of operations and supporting. And then we'd just meet back at the operations center every night coordinate our plans, uh, make sure that we're tied in. And really the whole time we were with the 1st Infantry Division in the attack positions, we were planning the support, uh, rehearsing with the troops, rehearsing with the units. Um, so so y'all kind of alternated on, on overseeing internal preparation and external liaison. Right, right. The XO was really stayed at the operations center and he really ran the, the current operations. So managing the site, uh, managing what was happening, receiving the units, sending units out. I mean, he, he, he was kind of, as a second in command, he kind of ran things at the operations center, which freed the battalion commander and I to go out and, and uh, do the coordination. Yeah, so that way, <coughs> Commander and I could focus future, focus on. XO focus now, and the Commander could slide back and forth where he needed to be. Uh, the plans. Uh, so we were in 18th Airborne Corps initially through January, and I've got the date. Okay, uh, this, this, For the was defense. The, this was the so-called speed bump. Right, here. so okay. the defense of Saudi Arabia, Desert Shield, right. we were with 18th Airborne Corps. This is kind of an interesting story. Um, Arsene, 3rd Army, was the higher headquarters Army component in theater. Uh, and there was a chemical officer, I, I want to say Lieutenant Colonel. I remember Lieutenant Colonel as a female. Uh, she was on the Arsene staff. So they were planning for combat operations, offensive operations. And so it was classified at the time. It was real compartmented because we were defending Saudi Arabia. We weren't doing anything offensive, so we were starting to plan. And so I remember she came to visit and we were talking and she said, okay, so here are the plans then. We've got a, another reserve battalion that's not even left the states yet coming in theater we're going to marry them up with the 7th Corps and they're going to support the attack you guys stay with the 18th Airborne Corps who will jump to the west and you guys will, will and that's how we're going to do the uh, the attack and so again from my tactical background and the hard-headedness I said okay whose main attack in the attack going north and they said 7th Corps is going to be the main attack. They're going to be the tank heavy force. And 18th Airborne Corps is going to be the supporting attack. They have more airborne and, and lighter forces. So I said, okay, I don't get this, 
We're from 3rd Corps at Fort Hood. We're used to supporting mech armor forces. We're here in theater. If that's your main attack, wouldn't it make sense for us to chop and move out there and support that fight? She goes, that, that, that's good. <laughs> she goes, can, it, can would you mind doing that? And I said, I'm sure the battalion commander would go for it because we just want to make the biggest difference to support the fight. Uh, as long as you don't quote us as asking to be, to be <laughs> free task organized, but I mean, if, if that's your main attack, I think that's we've got funny. the best right, right. training level and experience to do that kind of fight. And that's how we did it. But I said, if you do this, and throughout the war, I want to make sure we have orders. I don't want to do these fragmentary orders on the radio, go here, go there. I want people to know we're coming to them. I want to know that we're attached to them. And I ask for attachment, which kind of gets into the doctrinal issues. Because chemical forces normally like to be direct support or general support. They don't like attachment because... Now, explain the difference between okay. those terms. <clears throat> When you were attached to a unit, you belong to that unit. They need to feed you, fuel you, fix your equipment. You belong to them. Okay. They can, it could be taken away at some point in time, okay. but for all practical matters, you're part, you're of, that part unit. of that unit. Yes. I wanted that relationship because what I didn't want to do is to find ourselves in the middle of the desert and nobody can fuel us, nobody will fix us in the division. And so I said, I want attachment orders for the battalion, and then we'll execute the mission. <clears throat> and that's what we did. And that's what our set cut the orders, now attaching us. Now why would somebody us. not want to do that? Because if you have a chemical brigade, and we didn't have one in theater, if you have a higher headquarters, that brigade commander wants the latitude to flex doctrinally flex units on the battlefield where they need to and they feel attaching a unit really takes some of that ability for them to just change task organization on the fly. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I don't like that arrangement and why I push for attachment. So we got attachment orders. We got attached to 1st Infantry. Whenever you leave a unit, all your, your equipment that's in maintenance, you're supposed to take and drag with you and then put them in line, and it's at the back of the line for the receiving unit that you're going to. So, so Bill Lynn, our S4 smart guy, we said, okay, Bill, keep our broke vehicles in line in 18th Airborne Corps. We're going to drive what's drivable out there. Leave our, we need radios fixed, and we need vehicles fixed. Let's leave those in here, and we'll just come back to the port and pick them up when they're ready. Right. So that's what we did. Yeah. We went to the 1st Infantry Division and um, and I was concerned that again, the first day Bill Lynn came back and said, nobody will fix us because our patch doesn't say 1st Infantry and it's hard to get support. And I remember talking to the Division Artillery Commander and we were at a division update and he talked to the chief of staff of the division, the colonel, and said we had this problem. And he goes, I'll fix this. And he got this little memo pad and said, the second chemical battalion belongs to the big red one. Fix them, fuel them, you know, arm them, <laughs> them. sign chief of staff. And he, so Bill Lynn made copies of that. He had it in his pocket. Everybody carried a copy. And everywhere we needed some support. Oh, so funny. Do you have a copy of that still? I don't know if Bill kept Boy, one. that be something? Yeah. Now, other options are general support and direct support. Right. You know, what, what are those? That usually means if you come to a commander and, and you're in direct support, you support his operations, I think he has to approve your placement and, and everything, but he doesn't, he doesn't have responsibility for fueling and all those logistics things unless it's in the orders for direct support. General support is even more remote so it's like I may be on an area coverage and if I'm the decon for general support I'll support anybody in this box who comes for help. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and again as I thought through it 
We didn't have a chemical brigade in theater. Right. Um, I wanted to make sure that people knew who we belonged to and that we were supported. My main concern was to be left out there trying to find some core support unit who was supposed to give us gas or fuel. I mean, to me, it was it was cleaner if I belonged to this unit, then they helped support us, and, and that was a relationship we did. Um, I think that's more motivating to the guys anyway when they're belonging to somebody and they know they can develop relationships with these folks. I think and so. Go and work hard together. I think. Together, so. I think they, we we had tremendous we better. had tremendous support in the first infantry division, um, and I'll show you the graphics at some point in time down the road. But uh, in the maps in the Corps, the Seventh Corps orders, we belong to the First Infantry Division through the breach, through the minefields, and then once we secured the breachhead, we were supposed to chop and go to the Third Armor Division. Now you gotta imagine this, you know, big desert out there. We're with the tank, we're with this tank division, the first infantry division. We have the first British tank division passing through us in the fight, passing and shooting Iraqi forces, and then at some point in time, our battalion was supposed to leave that division and move on our own and link up with a tank division that becomes the main attack, who is in contact with the unit and, and pursuing. Wow. And I said, okay, what's wrong with this picture? You know, there's bad guys around all around us, and, and you want us guns. to leave the 1st Infantry and go to the 3rd Armored Division. I drove to the Corps Operations Center, and I remember talking to the Corps, full colonel, I was a major at the time, talking to the colonel to say, what are you guys thinking? And he goes, that's the order. Execute. I said, all right, I, I've told you all the problems. I am very concerned about fratricide. Uh, and so, came back to Colonel Kilgore, said, boss, <laughs> we execute the plan, of course not changing it, but we had co I had coordinated with an artillery brigade. It's a brigade of artillery, and they were uh, direct support of 1st Infantry Division in the breach, and then they were gonna chop and move to the 1st Armored Division, two divisions over at that same phase. So I talked to the brigade commander and I said, look, we're a chemical battalion, we gotta go to the 3rd Armored Division, the next division over. Do you mind if we move, fall in your line, in your convoys for force protection? And he goes, not a problem. He goes, I'm moving now. But he goes, fall in. So we did, we, wow. we fell in the back end. Wow. The 1st Infantry Division, <clears throat> because of all the, the attachments and reattachments and task organization, when we left the 18th Airborne Corps, our GPS that were coming in the theater, we never got our GPS. They ended up in the 18th Airborne Corps somewhere. We tried to get them from 1st Infantry Division, and they said, guys, I'll never forget the, the artillery guys, we belong to the artillery. Because okay? I asked to be attached to the artillery because they have communications throughout the division mm -hmm. zone. Mm -hmm. right. They know where all the forces are. Right. Key commander to make things happen. And I said, you know, that's the place we need to be because we're enough forward to be able to do our mission. So the artillery said, you know, guys, we love you. You're part of us, but you're not staying, you're not staying Big Red One. You're gonna become third armor division. So we can't afford to give up our GPS. So they sent one of their lieutenants with a GPS, and we went to a contact point, which is a point on the ground where you plan ahead of time to say, the friendly unit that's receiving you, meet me at this place, and then when I join you, then you take me back into your zone. Wow. So we had a plan. Got to the contact point, five in the afternoon, 6 p.m., starting to get dark. Nobody from 3rd Armored Division there. Nobody at the contact point. So my backup was, we're riding with this artillery brigade through the zone. So we moved through the night, and uh, because we didn't have GPS, I'm going by compass and the truck's odometer, the Humvee's odometer, and, and, and my map to see where we're at. And we're almost leaving the 3rd Armored Division zone, and we haven't seen anybody. 
and it's going to be two o'clock in the morning. Ooh. And I remember calling the battalion commander saying, boss, let's log her, circle the wagons, let's log her here tonight, put the track vehicles, armor vehicles on the outside, and let's just stay where we're at, and we'll try to find Fair Arm, Armor Division in the morning. Yeah, I got these little weird stories. Meanwhile, the good stories, huh? I had, I was concerned about distances for communications. Yeah. And, and we just had our radios, our uh, MSC radios and everything on Humvee with antennas. Limited range. Now, I remember talking to our combo sergeant to say, how can I boost range on this thing? Is there a way to do it? And he says, well, I could design you a directional antenna, but you got a, it's a long wire and that type of thing. He says, or I can get a 254, which is a big antenna with big antenna head and poles and everything. And he goes, we can, we can maybe our, uh, mount the bracket on the side of your Humvee. And then if you're stationary, you and the driver can put up the thing. We'll put the guide wires down and that ought to boost your range like double. I said, do it. So we were hauling this antenna in the back. So two in the morning, I said, Seaborn, we, we got to contact Third Armored Division. And so we tried with the radio, couldn't get through. It was, it was a stormy night, uh, but I was still concerned about Apaches hunting and seeing a bunch of yeah. hot spots, yeah. us down there. Uh, so Seaborn and I, about four in the morning, we put that radio antenna up, the wind was blowing. And we got back in, and I'm calling, and I'm calling, and I called the, I got contacted the first infantry division, the folks we just left, and their XO, I'll never forget, he basically said, I can't help you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna you get ready to go, bud? I'm the pack, and then be oh. to San Antonio. <laughs> so I might even stop at uh, Cabela's on the way down. Good plan. Good plan. Sir, good seat. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, you, we, oh, left, yeah. we left so, you in the middle of the desert at 4 so a.m. We Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Yeah. So, 1st Infantry couldn't help us. I was just trying to make contact to tell somebody where we were. Right, right, right. That was, that was my focus throughout that night. So, 1st Infantry didn't have time. And, and basically, the guy just basically said, I ain't got time for this. You know, you're, you're part of 3rd Armored Division. Out. Real. Yeah. Yeah. That, no. So first infantry was were they in seventh corps? Or eight? Yes. Seven okay. Corps. So you so you were not changing. So we're still course. right. Still okay. same corps. Seventh corps. So we're going to third armor division spearhead. So I had their call signs and frequency. So I dialed that in, calling, 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 and and I was up on their command push, figuring if anybody is monitoring, somebody's monitoring their command frequency, and I'll try to get somebody. So. I got somebody and I identified who we were. We're, we're being attached to the 3rd Armor Division. Our approximate location is here. And I remember thinking somebody in the operations centers found it on the map, said, okay, got where they are. It was a G3 of the division. And I remember him saying, Roger, we got you. We, and he says, Roger, I understand. We're in the middle of a tank fight right now. I'll get back to you later. Now, now I remember thinking, holy mackerel. The 3rd Armored Division is in contact with the Iraqis in a tank fight, but somebody has our grid coordinates and hopefully has it on the map that all well, the tanks are up here and we're back here, but we're, we're joining him. So uh, through the next day, uh, early morning, I remember seeing some fuel tankers kind of heading north. Figured tanks, fuel tankers, they go together pretty good. Let's follow them. So our whole battalion just followed these guys. Uh, and every chance I got, when I saw a signal communication center with antennas and everything, I'd drive over there and get a grid coordinate because they all had GPS. So on my map, you'll see kind of spots where we went. And amazingly, we were on fumes because we were all on our own for about 18 hours. Wow. No, but about a day and a half. We were on our own and we were moving. We had ran out. We're, we're refueling ourselves as a battalion, which again, we're not organized to really do that. So we were just sucking on all the, the tank and pump units that we had. We we're literally on fumes. And in the distance, as the sun is going down, I see a whole bunch of antennas. And I said, that is big enough to be a division. 
I hope it's the third armored division. <laughs> and we drove into the valley, loggered all of our vehicles. Commander and I drove up, and it was the third armored division headquarters, top. And we went up there, dusted ourselves off, and the chemical staff officer is the lieutenant colonel. So the battalion is a, the commander's a lieutenant colonel. So we walk up there and said, hi, this is 2nd Kim Battalion, we're just arriving, and we need some fuel. <laughs> and the staff officer said, guys, no problem, just pull your, your Humvees up to the tank and pump unit here, and we'll top you guys off. Top. And the battalion commander says, you don't understand. Do you see that formation out in the distance there? That's what I need fuel for. <laughs> and the guy goes, oh. <laughs> and again, it's it's staff versus commander, and it's it's perspective. Yeah. And they had a whole battalion that joined up with them. So, so we supported the Third Armored Division through the rest of the fight. And uh, incredible. And uh, did y'all fetch up at the airport? The Air Force had asked us. They were going to buy smoke generators. They were thinking about buying some for protection for air bases. Right. But they weren't sure whether that really works. So they asked our battalion to, to do a demonstration. And, and can you smoke in an air base? And then we're going to fly F-16s and A-10s against it and see whether that works. So we said, OK, so we got Fogwell. That's a whole other story. Fog oil, which is what the, it's mineral oil, mm -hmm. what the just smoke generators burn. Our smoke company that deployed over had some in a connex, never found it. Or they found one connex, but not, so they had very little. So we needed fog oil in theater. So they asked the, the oil companies to make this product. Uh -huh. So they made it, and they had like six varieties, and they wanted us to test it. And so we said, okay, so, so we did some smoke tests, but we used the smoke generators to cover King Fod Air Base. And yeah, they wanted, I, I couldn't think of the right, name. And they wanted day, they wanted early morning and midday. And so I was up in that control tower, because that's where I was kind of doing oh, my operation buddy, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we told them, I said, look, our doctrine, midday, the smoke is going to go straight up and you're not gonna get much effects. And the Air Force guy said, do it anyway, because we want to do the test. I said, okay, and we did it. And what we found was that the in the middle of the day, your smoke is gonna go straight up like a chimney stack, but then at some altitude, it hits, it hits what they call the inversion cap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never knew a, a, a thing existed like that. So when it hits the inversion cap, the smoke starts going horizontal again. Yeah, that's why you so often see clouds exactly. start at exactly the same elevation. Right. So it worked. And so yeah. the air base was able to do ground operations and, and put right. armaments on the aircraft and everything. And then, and then we even looked at, we could probably synchronize shutting off the generators for five minutes, turn them back on, and you'd have windows where the guys could take off. That's Because they needed visibility well, right, to take off. Right, right. They can Prove land in instruments. Right. But they needed a window to go to zip through. So, looked, but so, so that was a test exercise for the Air Force and, and not, uh, not concealment. Or right, right. Yeah, I, this didn't make it into finding my father's war, but based on what a guy in the 84th told me, I, I had said that um, if you drive one smoke track down the middle of a football field once, then nobody in the stands will be able to see anything on the field. If you drive it back again, then nobody in the stands will be able to see the other side of the stadium. And if you drive four of them down it, then nobody will be able to find their car when they leave. <laughs> We had smoke from those two companies. It, had, it was two um, wheeled vehicle decon units. So these were mounted on uh, uh, wow. on jeeps. Yeah, I see that. And those generators had Look enough. That. Look at to, those puppies. It covered, I think, all the way out to the ocean. I mean, it it covered a good amount of terrain. Yeah. And what the Air Force did was they flew uh, fighters fighters against King Fod Air Base. And what they found was that in order for the attacking jet to get the angle to shoot 
the ammo dump, which was their target on the air base. Right. In order to do that, they had to pop up to about 2,000 feet. At 2,000 feet, the air defense guys got them. So huh. they said, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, based on that demonstration, that we were able to obscure the air base and provide value-added protection, the Air Force bought fixed site smoke generators that they placed all around the air base. Really? Yeah. And then based on the incoming jet aircraft threat, they could turn them on yeah. How about and, that? and did that. So, so based on that demonstration. Yeah. Uh, we also, the battalion supported the president when he visited the troops in Thanksgiving of that year. Um, we worked with the Secret Service and, and uh, I remember talking to the agent because they said the president's coming, uh, we'd like to have protection if scuds are launched. Can you guys do that? Because we understand you have this Fox vehicle. I said, yeah, we got two platoons of them. So we worked it out on how we were going to support, we we're going to be there. And I, I remember the battalion commander saying, okay, so we have one for the president and Mrs. Bush, uh, you know, elder, right. so we got one for him, but what about, you know, General Schwarzkopf and all these other, and, and I remember the senior agent said, listen to me good, the president and the missus, I'm going to throw them in this vehicle and you move. He says, I am not worried about all these other people. That's who I'm worried about. I said, okay. Clarity okay, of mission. Okay, I can understand that. Clarity mission. of mission. So the battalion commander says, okay, one's for the president, we're going to have two for the other generals, too. So we had three foxes there. <laughs> and uh, and it was, if it's going to be 10 minutes to impact or less, we would go to a bunker, the Saudi Arabia, the air base bunker. Right. Uh, and if it was going to be 10 minutes or more, there was another bunker for the F-15 jets at the end of the runway that we would take them to. So. This, this is, these are my um, leader books. So a company had these giveaways and I said, oh, this, this fits pretty good. And so I had used these and, and I, I, it's, I'm a three by five card kind of guy. So I started Desert Shield like this. And, and uh, I mean, I wrote down, you know, this is a smoke mission, the rehearsal, the times that we were gonna do it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then after I would finish with a card, I'd, I'd throw it away. Uh -huh. And then after a while I thought, well, wait a minute, because I lost, you know, the unit and, and mm -hmm. so I, I finally started using these things, That's great, yeah. and it really worked out much better because, because you know, I would, I would just write phone numbers. I mean, I had a calendar. I had <coughs> just day by day notes. That's great. Of, of what what we did and and uh, and the operations. And I'm trying to see somewhere I have task organization, but. But we don't need to get that now. Okay. We, I, There's we a, there was a reserve battalion from um, from Alabama, 456th or 60th something, a battalion that was in theater in Desert Shield with us. So we were the first battalion there. They came over and helped. We arranged to kind of help each other out. And then there was a third battalion that was deployed over but like they were deploying in December January I mean they were just starting to flow over uh, I remember the s3 came over and, and and I said hey welcome to Saudi Arabia you guys are going to be supporting the 18th Airborne Corps these guys and so here's our plans here was the movement routes and all this kind of stuff and he goes well, where are you guys going and I said we're going to the first infantry right. division the seventh Corps Bye. Okay. And we left. It's weird little things. You, oh, yeah. Like in our plans, in the, in the operations plans, they had called for different objectives for the different uh, divisions. First armor, third oh. armor. So Waterloo, Norfolk and everything, who the divisions were. And then what was the Iraqi unit that they were going against? Uh -huh. So we had the 52nd Armored Division, Tawakana, Medina. We're not, we weren't sure. Uh, yeah. Not, but no, thy enemy. Yeah, but there were basically three chemical battalions in theater. Um, 
and a lot of companies, the, each division had a company and what we did was some of them were attached to us. So, so we had, uh, in the second Kim Battalion, we had for Desert 323rd Chemical Battalion was a National Guard Decon Battalion from South Dakota, South Dakota. Captain yeah, Snoozy huh. was the commander's name. I'll never forget Snoozy. Um, that was our, my experience in terms of the difference between reserve component and active duty. Because these guys were great at maintaining their equipment. They could take apart a generator, I mean a decon apparatus, put it back together, they could fix their trucks, they could do all those things. The tactical movement, the basic combat skills, they just didn't have the time to train. Mm -hmm. And so we had some interesting uh, yeah. things with, you know, get control of your company. Right. We, were, we were unwinding, uh, we did about a 150 kilometer move at night to get ready to attack. And so we were doing a big movement. It was the most confusing night I remember because the first British tank division was starting out on our left flank. And they actually crossed over in front of the 1st Infantry Division. So this is two divisions, 20,000 soldiers each, yeah. crossing in the middle of the night. So they crossed in front of us. We're moving at night with night vision goggles on. The reserve guys don't have night vision goggles. Uh, so these poor kids are driving 40 miles an hour across the desert blind. They're looking at the blackout lights in front of them and that was their navigation. Oh, oh man. And I remember we kept they kept we kept losing the 323 because they kept following the British units. And what was happening was the British vehicles black out tactical lights much brighter than the US. And they were like moths at the night. They'd see a brighter vehicle and so all night we were policing them back up with us. That's uh, and I remember jumping out of the vehicle at, with the commander, company commander, running up to his thing, ripping open his door, I was going to chew him out, and poor Snoozy had his eyes wide open and he couldn't see what was going on. And, and I said, I I'm sorry Snooze, I said, you need to get Night your time. unit. They didn't have secure comms, so on the, com on the communications, I'm talking on the secure, but I'd have to <coughs> go unsecure to talk to Snoozy. That's crazy. It was, it was, it was crazy. They, the reserve, cascade, they get equipment from the active duty over time, and their unit never got night vision goggles and never got secure That's radio just... equipment. And you know, we learned that when we were digitizing the Army, when we first started 4th Infantry Division here on post, was the first digitized division. And I was a battalion commander at the time, we were supporting them in an in a exercise, a warfighter exercise. So we had applique, computers, and really high-speed stuff. And they were doing video streaming and all that kind of stuff. Had a tactical internet going. And I remember coming to the first uh, review with, his, with the general and all the commanders and everything, and how all the commanders were saying, you know, I'm not getting crap. You know, what is going on? And it's like, I, I don't know. You know, no, nothing is coming through. The signal officer stands up at the briefing and goes, communications is doing great. We're up 100%, the division, that, and all of his commanders are looking around, and finally a tank brigade commander says, bullshit. He goes, I haven't gotten one thing today. And the general says, Sigo, go find out. And what happened was, there was so much traffic being generated, and what people were doing was sending PowerPoint briefing slides with pictures and all this stuff, <laughs> megabytes of, of data, and it was all cluttered in there, so it's all in the queue. It's working fine, but it's all in this queue. Nothing it's came all through going in. So that's when the chief of staff of the division said, okay guys, the first electronic rules of engagement. No more pictures on your briefing slides. That's right. No more combo check and telling everybody in the world that you move from this location to this, because what they were doing was, if a unit moved low headquarters locations, they sent a, an internet message, tactical internet, to everybody mm -hmm. saying, this is us and we just moved, here's our new location. 
clutter. He goes, yeah. don't need that. Right. He goes, you send it to the G3, he's right. got it plotted. We'll put it in the database so everybody has visibility. Don't need it flying around Lake Shot. So we learned you could crash a system just by all the yeah. stuff you're trying to get through. Uh, yeah. We're now seeing briefings 30, 40 megabyte. Yeah. Randy yeah. knows the reason for that. He told me that one time. There's yeah. something that. And the other thing is, people don't know how to use the master slide. So right. they, they put the coloring on every slide. And so in, instead of just adds up. one color pattern that gets reproduced 40 times, you have 40 repetitions wow. of that background pattern. Um, yeah, so, so the battalion had some interesting missions over there from the defensive yeah. side. Oh, another one. I talked about that. Movement at night, reserves didn't have night vision goggles and everything. Another interesting thing, remember I told you that 1st British Tank Division, the Desert Rats, went in front of us, the Big Red One, right. in the middle of the night. I thought that was the most screwed up operation. It's like, who planned this? General Yosak, the Army Commander, a couple of years later was here, and, and I was a battalion commander at that time, and he did a, a officer professional development thing, and he talked about a grand rehearsal. And he goes, that movement was my rehearsal. And I thought about it and it's like, holy mackerel, it was. Every division was moving in relative direction and on each side as we did, attacked into Iraq. And the 1st British Tank Division did in fact come through 1st Infantry and pass us going to the east. Uh, and we actually did that in Iraq. And I remember um, first day of the ground war, we're moving into Iraq north. Here comes the XOs on the radio. And the XO says, I got a traffic, we, we can't move. And I said, Larry, what do you mean we can't move? This is a desert, right? There's nothing. <laughs> he goes, we're stuck. There's an artillery unit regiment trying to cross in front of us and we're jammed up. So I drive up there and sure enough, we're literally crossed in the middle of the desert here. There's a stream of artillery here in our formation with track vehicles and wheels and decon and everything going the other way. And we're just totally loggered. And so I thought, okay, how do I undo this? Because we're attacking, we need to move. <laughs> they need to move. Yeah. And we're both important. And so I thought, wait a minute, I thought I saw a movie that Patton got out and was directing traffic. I said, I said, Seaborn, put the vehicle over here, get the Humvee over here. So I climbed up and I pointed to the artillery guy and I had our oh. guy and I said, you go. <laughs> he goes. And then I said to the next artillery guy, I said, you go. Oh, I love and, and we did this and it worked. We, we then just started one at a time passing each other. Yeah. But we got things moving. It's like, it does work. <laughs> So then we took off again. <laughs> this says like, Hollywood's not helpful to the war. I would have never, I would have never wow. imagined. So yeah, we did that with the first tank division, British. Sheesh. A uh, lot of information, and, oh, and again, the timeline for the battalion really is from August when we were alerted to prepare to move. Um, the we sent uh, advance parties in September, I think. Main body flowed in October. We did the support of Saudi Arabia 18th Airborne Corps through December and then early January 5th. We got chopped to the 7th Corps, 1st Infantry, and we moved out. And so, so this is our attachment orders to the Duvardi, Division Artillery. I mm -hmm. said, give me, give me to the artillery guys, and they did. Just operationally, what I found works, and for maneuver guys, they would never think about sending a tank battalion general support over here because who's going to fix them? Mm -hmm. Who's going to give them fuel? I mean, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so the maneuver guys would never do that kind of thing. They chop, attach, or detach as as they need to. Um, and uh, and a chemical unit is not logistically self-sustaining. We're organized because we are a, a echelons above division kind of unit, and for the most part, we need additional mm -hmm. outside support. Um, this was this was from uh, 
our set. So this was the Lieutenant Colonel at Army getting the order to 7th Corps and basically attaching us to 1st Infantry. So that was our thing saying, we're there. We belong to the Big Red One. What was the radio call sign for the battalion? Um, we, uh, a lot of times we, we did abbreviated call signs. So Red Dragon okay. was, was what we did. Yeah. Our mascot yeah. and our shield, and we said that's that's who we're going to be, and that's that's what we did. Uh, uh, okay, now here's the 457th Chemical Battalion referred to. That must be the Alabama unit. Yeah, the battalion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be one of the battalions. Yeah, these are the company attachment orders. Uh, I mean, these are just different orders. That I got one here that you might find interesting. If I hope it's in here. Attachment to Dragon Brigade, 18th Airborne Corps. These are some of the photos from the Air Force combat camera guys. Oh, uh, yeah. They were just documenting the... It was an air base, uh, air, it was airport under construction. Yeah. I don't think it was completed. Well, we were there. And we just kind of took it over, and the Air Force took it over, and... Yeah, I think you're right, it wasn't Apaches. completed. No. Sir, mm -hmm. we understood the, the Arabs don't like you to take. This is an Air Force combat camera that took it. And I thought, hey, could you print that for me? That's a beautiful. <laughs> I know it's exquisite. Yeah. yeah. You take it yourself. You might get stoned. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But uh, but yeah, it's all on that air base. Oh, these these are just the sequence. So this is that. Oh yeah. Camera that they could look at the sequence. They could make a picture right away. Oh yeah. So the color is changing yeah, over awesome. time, but yeah. Yeah. Somewhere, and I don't know where it is right now, but somewhere I have a copy of the deployment order for the chemical battalion, the second chem battalion, leaving Fort Hood and going to support Desert Shield. And it was signed in red felt marker, something Powell. Oh. And I thought, and, and we saw it when we came back from the deployment and we were going through all of the reams of stuff. And I happened to look at this order and it's signed by Colin Powell. And I thought, no. So I kept it. And then when I went to the Pentagon uh, after war college right. and everything, um, I, I happened to talk to somebody who knew Colin, and I go, is this his signature? And he goes, yeah. He goes, he did a bunch of thanks, thanks for your support or something, a little note to every unit that was sent over, and he did that, and I thought, so I've, I've got it somewhere, I don't know where it is. And so I thought that was kind of cool to yeah. actually have something from yeah. the chairman. Yeah. Stuff. So, got that somewhere. These are just the that. graphics that C Battalion Commander and I, when we came back out of the Gulf, um, got my, my overlays and maps and everything, and we had some photos done because we wanted to do a briefing for the Chemical Brigade Commanders Conference. So this is just the big picture of 7th Corps Attack Zone, 18th Airborne Corps, and the 1st Infantry's breach lanes and our operations and where we're going. So so where did you start off and then go to? We, uh, for the war, we started right about where that X is. Okay. We might use this. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so, yeah, we started at, at, that, at that X. We went through the breach. Then we went over here to a contact point in the 3rd Armor Division zone, uh, and then we continue to follow 3rd Armor Division into the final attack. And so here you can kind of see the, the force array. So you had the 1st Cav Division as the, art, the theater deception in the, in the Wadi al -Platin. This is like the valley here. Right. And so you had the 1st Infantry Division, 2nd Armored Cav Regiment, and you had the 3rd Armored Division that picked up main attack. And so as we attacked through the lanes, through the Iraqi forces in place, uh, and, 
then we went north and joined the 3rd Armored Division in their lane and then moved with them. And, and my, my actual map has little purple dots of a felt pen that I had of where we went as we crossed in from Iraq into uh, Kuwait and ended up in the war. But we ended up the war just inside Kuwait. There's a hardball uh, asphalt road, and that's the border. And I remember coming out of this valley, there was a minefield, so everybody was single file. I had told the battalion commander, let me go forward, link up with our unit, and then get a place that we're going to logger the battalion that night. And so we had gone forward, and I mean, they were there were tanks on, enemy tanks on fire, there were policing up crews. Uh, in the dark, the oil, I remember the oil fires with the night vision goggles, it was just really bright. Uh, and so I said, well, how, you know, to my driver, I said, Seaborn, how are we going to find our way back? I said, we need to mark it somehow. So I said, smart, let's do our chem lights. We'll, we'll, we'll do the chemical lights, break them, and then we'll stick them on little rods, and that'll be our, our marker. And, and after we were driving away, I looked back, and you see all the oil? Uh, you couldn't see anything. See, I thought, yeah. okay, so, so much for that. Yeah. But we went back to the hard stand road, middle midnight probably by that time. And by that time, uh, our battalion was just coming up. And I remember calling saying, Where, I want to link up with you guys. Where are you? And Captain Butler was one of the company commanders. And he says, I'm, I'm just crossing a hard stand road. And I go, I see you. Oh. And we just happened, so I said, follow me, led the battalion in. We circled the wagons again that night, and we were with the support division support command on the flank there. So we circled. Next morning, I remember getting up and looking out, and about two, 300 meters, there were little bumps in the sand, and I swear it looked like a tank gun tube pointing. I thought, Okay. Dang, what is that? So I got seaborne, we drove out there. It was an it was an Iraqi tank battalion had been dug in down to the turrets and their gun tubes were pointing all at us. I didn't even see them that night. But I found out that the, that night when we were occupying, the infantry were policing the prisoners and rounding them up. And so I had a tank that I had found that fits, it works on a, on a T-72 tank. So I opened up the hatch and looked inside, full of ammunition, full of the, the tank bustle rack was full of ammo, full of fuel, all the machine guns were armed. Uh, they even had um, um, burlap tied over the barrels uh -huh. to keep the dirt, dirt out. It was like, all you had to do was crank it and go. And there was a whole tank battalion sitting in front of us. Wow, we did not know. Oh. So scary. Crazy. <clears throat> but yeah, that was the operation. And, and so, again, the 18th, or, you know, 7th Corps is, is the three X's are a core boundary. Mm -hmm. So, three core was on this side. I mean, the 7th Corps was here and 18th Airborne Corps. I remember General Franks saying something after the war like we had. 144,000 troops in 7th Corps. Mm -hmm. I think he had like 1,500 tanks or something. Uh, the, the 457th was supporting the 18th Corps. Right. And was 2nd Chemical supporting the three U U.S. divisions in 7th Corps? All, the, the whole 7th Corps. Including the British? Yes. And then we were focused and attached because the 1st Infantry was main attack. And so that's why okay. I recommended that if that's your main attack and this is, we're going to have to break through here and reach these minefields and obstacles, that's where we need to be. And that's, that's where the 7th Corps agreed. And so we were, that's why we were with them through the breach. And then after the breach, the 3rd Armored Division became main attack. What happened was the British tank division, when they came through, they they had they operated a little bit differently. And they said, okay, once we pass through the 1st Infantry Division, we're going to have what they call a forming up point, a FUP. And we thought, okay, that's a weird title, but you're going to actually stop and regroup in the middle of a fight 
and then attack? And they go, yeah, that's what we do. So, and they said, and we want, if we get slimed in the, in the crossing, we want decon too. Okay. That sounds awfully Montgomery-esque. Yes. So we did. So we said, all right, that's there your you decon know. point. And so these were the two initial, and then once the forces flowed out here, then we jumped one of the companies forward and they maintained the decon point in case the in British case needed it. it. Okay, so you you kept your most your your decon assets were here and some displaced to here. So what you right. were moving around with was more detection and smoke assets? No, smoke and and and, uh, and decon. We had we had like I said the two uh, a company at each point. Okay. Uh, I had a uh, uh, yeah, we had two companies of decon and two companies of smoke um, in in supporting First Infantry Division. So I had one company each here. Oh, I'm sorry, three companies of decon. I had the the company that belongs to the First Infantry was attached to us, right. which I said we need to pure. We need to get the command relationship stuff. The division's company belongs to the division artillery. And I said, okay, when we come to you, attach them to us so that I can control and maintain them and all that kind of stuff. We're attached to Duvardi, but for command relationships, they would report and we would tell them mission-wise what they would do. So I had the, the first infantry division's company here, and then I had the, uh, uh, 323rd Chemical Company here, and then as we move forward, then the 1st Infantry Division was going to come and attack in this zone, because the 1st, yeah, here's the 1st UK, and, and the 1st Infantry, they shrunk their, theirs down a little bit, and then the 1st Infantry. So that company stayed with the, with the division. So the previous commander, Colonel Visser, was the company commander for that company. That's where we first met. It was over in the sand. And then right before we attacked, we got intelligence and photos to show that the Iraqi tanks were being pulled back. And they were pulling their heavy forces back. And this was a, a draft, drafty division, Iraqi division. Um, and so the maneuver guys were saying, as we go through the breach, we won't need your smoke anymore because you can't keep up with the Bradleys because we only had the A2 Brad uh, uh, 113s. So they said, since you can't keep up with us, we rather not you follow us through the gap and everything, why don't you go back to the battalion? So we brought them back. And, uh, and, and so they stayed with us and, and I, put them forwarded on the flanks for security mm -hmm. as we move through. Now, who was over on the right of 7th Corps? Uh, 1st Cav Division. So General Talali and 1st Cav Division, if you could imagine, like right here, the 1st Cav, this, this is like a valley. But it's not, mm -hmm. a, it's not a real steep valley. If you look at the Wadi al Batin, it's literally a big, gradual down and back up. And so they were positioned on our flank here to replicate the, the Army's main attack. Ah, okay. And they came through. We had a tank brigade from the 2nd Armored Division, the Tiger Brigade, moved with the, uh, with the Marines, a Marine Division. They were attached. And so they were replicating the main attack through here, whereas really the main attack was coming this mm -hmm. way. And that's why when we swept in from the west, mm -hmm. a lot of the Iraqi tanks were dug in and facing that south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. very, very so yeah, 1st Cav Division was on our flank. And literally when you look at the division when we were in the defense part here, you had the 1st Cav Division and the next vehicle over the boundary was a mech smoke track from uh, one of our companies. There was something that occurred which I thought was really bizarre afterwards and that is uh, somebody said they deployed some bio detection assets into theater. Mm -hmm. They had a bids company or something that deployed there. Nobody ever told us. Yeah. And so again it's like I don't know where they were, who, who were they supporting, 
uh, one of the key things that I kept emphasizing to our company commanders and, and from, from a survivability force protection, there's no lone actors out there. If you're in somebody's sandbox and they can shoot you, they need to know who you are, what are you doing, and where are you going. And so I made sure all of our folks were tied in, they were either attached, people knew who they were and what they were right, doing. Right, right, right. The core, whoever, chemical core, somehow got a chemical bids a biodetection company over there. Dangerous. I, I don't know where they were. If they were roaming the battlefield, who was protecting them or where were they lagered? I, I don't know. But I found that out after, well, after the doing? fact. But it, did know. the chemical core have a presence further down south in in um, in Saudi Arabia or even over in uh, Israel where they were concerned about Scuds hitting? Uh, not that I'm aware of unless they sent some decon assets. It wasn't from our battalion. Um, in the, in the defense of Saudi Arabia, we had assets to respond, you know, if Riyadh got hit or something, but, but again, we, we were We mean chemical? Right, okay. and, and, the, and that reserve unit. So we had very limited assets, and the 18th Airborne Corps was main effort, and so we were focused at Dahran, Dammam, and the Lajman site. So, so when you talk about the chemical core in the Gulf War, you're really talking about the second and the four and fifty seventh and that other company that that other battalion, that, yeah, that finally yeah. came over. Oh, it's oh, the third battalion. So, yeah, okay. so there were uh, three yeah. battalions total. No, that that was a company. Yeah. So we ended up with three chemical battalions in the theater. And again, I'll have to look somewhere to see what outfit it was. I found this, this is kind of interesting, uh, and again, down the road, we'll make time to go over it, but after the ground war, we were getting ready to go back, and I was looking, my driver and I were reconning routes out of Kuwait, back into Saudi Arabia, and not go through minefields for the battalion. So we were doing some reconnaissance, and we ended up back at KKMC, which is this, it's a city that was built for the military in the middle of the desert, See it, KKMC. I think I, I, think, I think that's it. Or it's here. But this is Tapline Road, so that is the only hard asphalt road that parallels the the pipelines that goes out into the desert. And so south of there, I want to say maybe it's here. There is a city called KKMC, and the Saudi government had built the city. I mean, it, to include buildings and and rooms and everything it's empty <laughs> so we based out of there the u.s based out of there they had a small contingent and i guess they built the city in case they might need it to mobilize their forces yeah who knows so uh, i know u.s soldiers using toilet paper does not their whole septic system was not meant to have toilet paper so that caused a huge huge mess <laughs> Cultural difference. It is, it is, we found that out. But so reconning our way back, 7th Corps uh, rear was at KKMC. And again, I'll, I, 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 I want to say it was, out, it was down here. Because you go south on the road, and there's just a, a city, unless, unless maybe scale wise, you know, by over here. But, they, I found out from the public affairs officer, they, they're putting together a yearbook for 7th Corps. And I go, well, do you have 2nd Kim Battalion in there? And he goes, no, who are you guys? <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> so in the here- The story of the chemical battalion's lives. It is. So in here, they have every major unit in 7th Corps. So with pictures of, you know, General Franks and kind of what we were doing. Um, yeah. See some mm -hmm. graphics. This was an amazing sight to see. When we attacked into Iraq, that is what you saw as far as your eye could see from left and right was that image. And it was like, I, to have that much combat power on the field at one time was just, to me, mind-boggling. It was all heading north.
But this yearbook shows yeah. um, every major unit that was in the fight uh, and where they were. Um, yeah, so so this was yeah, so this was the graphics in the first armor division on the flank, second armor cav regiment, third armor division, first infantry division, and the first British tank division. Uh, was all part of Seventh Corps. So they so they did this year in this whole thing. Well we were getting ready to fly back to Texas, the second Kim Battalion. By then we had all the companies, we had seven companies attached to the second Kim Battalion. Ah, and we're trying to sort out flights and everything to get them redeployed. And I remember the again, Seventh Corps said, okay, to clean up the vehicles to meet agricultural standards, we're gonna assign that to the chemical folks. And so second chem battalion, that's your mission. And so because of that, we've taken you off the return flow on aircraft, and, and we'll put you guys on somewhere. So I, I went and I found the planners, majors that we went to the work to the command and general staff college together. I said, you got to get us on the flow. I said, we don't take us off the flow. We'll get this thing done, but don't take us off. And he goes, okay. And he, and he left us on, even though the core chemical officer we thought we were, we were off the flow. But I went to every division and I said, what is your plan for cleanup? Every division had their own plan. They weren't looking at the core to clean them up. Uh, and again, it, it took just amazing resources to really do a cleanup in the middle of the desert. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, uh, uh, we supported the 2nd Armored Cab Regiment at KKMC because we got a chunk of ground from them. And so because of that, we helped them in their cleanup and everything. But literally, in, in the cleanup, we created a lake. I mean, even oh. though the chemical officer for the regiment had dug a sump and done all the doctrinal stuff, right? By the, by the end of it, there was a lake in the desert where all the runoff water. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's written now. King, okay. King Khalid that's Military it, City. Yeah. KKMC. Yeah. yeah. And so when you hear um, uh, Tap, Tap Line, line road, road, that's, that's it. the road. Which was an indicator. This was our attack position. So that's where we first joined the first, uh, the X is where we were. But that's where we first joined the 1st Infantry Division. So that was Tactical Assembly Area Roosevelt. And then, to get ready for the attack, we moved from there to here overnight. And that's where you had all those divisions all moving at one time, and it was like the craziest ah, thing I'd ever seen. Okay. That's how we all ended up. And then, when yep. we attacked north, it was in the relative positions that... Yeah. Set up already. Um, I would like to get copies of these. Well, I tell you what, at some since I'm point. going to be working with you guys, I've got the maps. Take these, okay? Oh, and those That's are a copies. reference. Oh, yeah, those are just photos that we okay, had got. Okay, good. Good. We came yeah. back and everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, so you got the original piece yes. of paper of this. Okay. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah, I've got the map sheet, and one of my map books is at the Chemical Museum in oh, cool. Fort Leonard Wood. Yeah at the display, the guy who's holding a map case or whatever. No, but when so. you walk into the Desert Storm part, right. there's a mannequin and a person's holding a map case. And, right. so that, and then that was a bigger scale map. And then oh, I had another great. scale map. Uh, and my driver, he's such a great kid. He was a young soldier at the time. If yeah. he's still in, I saw him later. He was a staff sergeant several years ago. But just a great, uh, I mean, uh, from, from being able to just see more, and I, I need graphics, and I'm used to just sloppy, you know, I kind of trace on yeah. an overlay, and he comes up with this kind of no, thing, yeah. and it's just, and, and I said, okay, Seaborn, we've got a map book that you've made for me, but the overlays, how do I put the overlay on each map sheet? Right. He figured well, out, well, and he had it like this, this, uh, this deck, that uh -huh. the overlays folded from one side and the other oh, and this awesome. over mm -hmm. each page. And so yeah. as we moved on the fight, I could put a, the oh. right overlay on that part of the map. Yeah. It was great. Cool. So I still got that one. Yeah. And some of the preparatory, I, I mean, just getting ready, deploying over there, getting in theater, and having 
you know, how do you protect this whole it's a good, country? It's a good overview. Uh, oh, yeah, well, and, and and I, I'm smart. sure we could spend another couple hours talking about, uh, you know, getting ready for deployment and then, and then coming back. Yeah, that's why I'm just glad that, you know, you, you got this interest to do this because, um, Great story. There are so many, so many lessons that we picked up out of there that we still are seeing yeah, us relearn. Yeah, I can see some lessons here. Yeah. Juan Camargo uh, was a first sergeant in HHD. So from the headquarters company detachment uh, area, I mean, he he knew what was happening and he made things happen. Uh, he works here on post. But he, uh, his phone number, well, let me give you his email. Okay. It's uh, J-U-A-N, one dot Camargo, C-A-M-A-R-G-O, at hood dash C-T-S-F, -F, mail, all one, mm -hmm. dot army dot mil. Okay. Okay, and his phone number, let me give you his, his cell. It's area code 254 535 6117. Okay. Okay, so he was the first sergeant for HHD. A lot of connections with other NCOs and folks that for the other companies and things. So he may have some really good uh, insights in there. You've got William King's yes, contact yeah. information. And now he, what was he? He was the executive officer for the 46 Mech Smoke Company. They would not send them, the Mech Smoke Companies, into theater in Desert Shield because they didn't need smoke at that mm -hmm. point. And so we were working on them trying to get on the on the flow list so they could get aircraft and get over there. And they finally, for the ground fight, we said we need mechanized smoke in there. Right. So they got approved and on the list and came over. When we left, we left with the 181st Chemical Company and the headquarters detachment, and the, and the headquarters, the battalion headquarters. Uh, and at that time, the 46th Mech Smoke Company was left behind. They weren't on the list. And so we started the, the Desert Shield portion. We had our own decon company, and then we received attachment of a couple of other decon <coughs> companies. Okay. And then getting ready for the ground fight, the 46 came over. We got attachment of another mech smoke company, probably the only two in the Army at the time. So we had two mechanized smoke companies. Um, 181st stayed with 18th Airborne Corps. So they they went with that reserve battalion mm -hmm. and stayed with the 18th Corps. And then we picked up the 323rd. No, no, they stayed with us. So we kept the 323rd and we picked up um, the first infantry division was coming. So we had two and two. Okay, so so you the so the first ID is organic chemical company was attached to you. Yes. Okay. It, it was like uh, Phil would kill me. Sixteenth uh, chemical company. You won't forget something like that. that. Yeah, it'll, right. it'll, it'll come it back to you. Okay, it'll add in. Let me give you another name. Um, just because I I know him real well. And again, for these guys, just tell them that we talked and what you're doing. I, I, I'm sure they would love to do this. He's now Lieutenant Colonel. His name is Brian Butler, and he was a company commander for the 46. So William was his XO, okay. and and Brian is the uh, was a commander for the company. He's up in the Joint Staff right now. His email is Brian dot Butler B U T L E R. And that's B R I A N? B R I A N, right. At J S dot Pentagon dot mil. And his phone number <coughs> is uh, area code 703 697 944 William he was, uh, he was a lieutenant in Desert Storm. And he was one of my guys that I would turn to. I mean, if I had to get something done, I'd get on the radio and say, William, meet me at my location now. Right. And he, and he was always very helpful. 